William Wallace. Outlaw, freedom fighter, and ultimately, martyr. Made famous, first of all, by the poet, Blind Harry. A man who sounds like he should be in a Guy Ritchie movie. Then by Walter Scott, the man who monetised Scotland. And more recently, by a sort of Australian who isn't really Australian Hellraiser. Not that one. But what do we actually know about him? Who was he really? Where did he come from? And what does it actually matter today? Welcome to Scotland Unplugged and the story of Scotland's greatest hero. This one kind of got out of hand. There was a road trip, and then another road trip, and then another smaller road trip, and then a very long walk, and then the time Google Maps tried to kill me. Wallace is a big character and one I wanted to tackle head on and get right. He is quite a big subject, quite an emotive subject. In case you haven't guessed, the name Parker isn't very Scottish, despite the fact some people have tried to tell me it is. Like a lot of people in the UK, I'm a bit of a mudblood, a bit of a mishmash. Sort of a quarter English, three quarters Scottish. But like everything with history, it's complicated. I suppose the first question is, why was he needed at all? Like a lot of the good stories, we begin with a few cheeky beers. This is Edinburgh Castle in Edinburgh. Scene of many a drinking session. On the night of the 19th of March, 1286, the King, Alexander III, is holding a council meeting in the castle. Alexander's reign's been pretty successful, but not without tragedy. First of all, his wife died. On the plus side, she had provided him with three heirs, but then they died. Then he bagged himself a new wife, 21 years his junior. Having concluded council business for the day and taken on the odd cheeky libation, Alexander wants to go home. But home is on the other side of the fourth, and there's no bridge yet. What there is, is a storm blowing up. Like many a drunken man before him, Alexander will not be told. He ignores the advice and pleading of his aides and rides for Domeni, persuades the ferryman to ferry him across. When he reaches the other side, his aides plead with him again, try to get him to see sense, but he rides off into the night. The following morning, they find him dead on the ground, having fallen from a horse and broken his neck in a place called Kinghorn. Luckily, he leaves behind a granddaughter. Before she expired, his daughter married the King of Norway and produced an heir, Margaret, known as the Maid of Norway. Age seven, Margaret sails for Scotland. And then she dies. Things are a bit messy. There's a power vacuum. The nobles have been quietly conniving about who can helpfully look after the interests of a child's queen, but now they've got the chance to go after the top job themselves. Jack, and indeed, Pot. Thirteen of them happily throw their hats in the ring. Now, they have to choose themselves a new king. When that doesn't work, they decide they need an adjudicator, a higher power, an elder statesman, someone who can point them in the right direction. Enter Edward the Longshanks, King of England, possibly the greatest military commander of his day, and a bit of a land-grabbing addict. You can see where this one's going. Longshanks, he agrees he'll settle the matter for the measly price of them all declaring him Lord Paramount of Scotland, their feudal overlord, boss of all bosses, etc, etc. The nobles slash snivelling self-servers all agree. Now a lot of people want Robert the Bruce, not the famous one, but his granddad. He's seen as a strong leader, 
someone who'll stick up for Scotland's interests. But Edward doesn't agree. He thinks John Balliol's a better option, mainly because he has all the guts of a sock puppet. The deal is done. Balliol's in the hot seat. Things continue as before, only a little bit worse. Balliol gives in to all of Edward's demands until the unexpected happens, and he doesn't. He's under pressure from his own nobles who set up a Council of Twelve to undermine him and effectively cut him out of the decision making process. They don't want to fund Edward's expensive war with France, so they stab their king in the back. I suppose you could argue it doesn't matter if there's no spine to hit. Then they sign a treaty with France. So Edward does what all good feudal overlords do well when challenged and goes ballistic. He marches north with an army. Edward arrived in Berwick-upon-Tweed with a force of 30,000 and laid siege to the town for two days. Walter Bower picks up the story in the Scotty Chronicon. When the town had been taken in this way and its citizens had submitted, Edward spared no one, whatever their age or sex. And for two days, streams of blood flowed from the bodies of the slain, for in his tyrannous rage, he ordered 7,500 souls of both sexes to be massacred, so that mills could be turned round by the flow of their blood. Longshanks didn't stop there though. The English army kept on marching. Balliol eventually surrendered in Brecon. In a last act of humiliation, the lion rampant was ripped from his tunic, earning the title Tomb to Bard or empty coat, and then he wound up in the Tower of London. Now he'd officially invaded, Edward didn't waste any time. He set up garrisons throughout the country, controlled by his own sheriffs. Things weren't looking good for Scotland. Enter William Wallace. There are a few different versions of his story mainly because there are so many different narrators. He's thought to have been born in Eldersley in Renfrewshire, eh, uh, here. The son of a minor knight, Malcolm Wallace. But some people claim it was Eldersley in Ayrshire and that he was the son of an Alan Wallace. That's based on a letter that was sent to the merchants of Lübeck in Germany following the Battle of Stirling Bridge, basically telling them that Scotland was open for business. He was famously a man of the people except he was the son of a minor knight, which means he kind of wasn't. The Wallaces were vassals or subjects of the Fitzalan family, the High Stewards of Scotland, who would later become the Stuart dynasty, which could explain the name on the seal. Some people have speculated that the words Felis Alani, son of Alan, could mean Fitzalan, which would explain that away. I said it was complicated. Behind me there in the enclosure is the Wallace Yew, which is only about 300 years old. There are the remains of a noble house here, and it's not the ruins behind me. Um, that supposedly dates from about the 17th century, whereas the actual 13th century remains, which would back up this being Wallace's birthplace, are picked out by the line of shrubbery by what was probably a good measure of coincidence, the Victorians had already gone all in and built the monument behind me. But the sign at the entrance here declares it to be the traditional birthplace of William Wallace. So even they're hedging their bets. The place name's been misspelled a lot over the years. I mean really, it only matters if you come from Ellerslie in Ayrshire or Eldersley in Renfrewshire. The name Wallace means foreigner or possibly Welsh, maybe because the family came from Wales, but maybe also because they spoke a Brythonic language that was spoken in Wales, but also all the way up to Strathclyde. The first actual contemporary evidence we have of Wallace is when he turns up in Lanark. Oh, he didn't have woad on his face by the way. That was the Picts 400 years earlier. Actually. While we're on the subject, he wouldn't have worn a kilt either. He was a medieval noble, not a highland drover. And kilts wouldn't be invented for another 
300 years or so. Sorry. A lot of the images you see of him are of a middle-aged man with a big kind of bushy beard. Which isn't a bad thing. Those were based on a sketch by David Erskine, the Earl of Buchan, which he claimed he copied from a much earlier medieval painting. Nobody knows where that painting is or if it ever existed. He probably looked most like he does on the statue in Edinburgh Castle, dressed in chainmail so he can manoeuvre easily and wouldn't have needed things like squires to dress him, which isn't handy when you're an outlaw on the run, living in a forest. This is Lanark Thistle Bowling Club. This, before it was a bowling green, was Lanark Castle, which is thought to date back to Roman times. Here's where the contradictory, unsubstantiated history kicks in again. Harry has it that Wallace actually had a wife in Lanark, and their name was Marion Braidfoot. But, and it's quite a big but, she doesn't actually appear until a 1570 version. If you read the original 1508 version of Blind Harry's text, there is no Marion Braidfoot. It's thought she could have been written in later on by a family from Lamington who wanted to ingratiate themselves at the court of Mary Queen of Scots by proving they were related to William Wallace. I mean, it's a big boast. The name Marion was one that would have been used in tales around the time. It's obviously associated with Robin Hood, and it's thought that might have been an influence in the retelling. If you think about it, Harry was kind of a wandering minstrel, a guy who travelled the country entertaining people with stories of Scottish history, but that's kind of what they were. It's entertainment, in much the same way Braveheart is. Randall Wallace changed the name to Murren when he wrote the script of Braveheart, presumably to avoid any kind of confusion with Robin Hood, but there's zero evidence she ever existed. Which isn't to say she didn't. Harry says that Wallace was hiding in his new father-in-law's house and legged it out the back door, at which point his wife was taken from the house and executed by William de Hesselrig, the English High Sheriff of Lanark. Wallace returned, fueled by vengeance and bloodlust, snuck into Lanark by night and crept into Hesselrig's apartment. Wallace sliced through his skull to the collarbone with his sword. Whether that part's actually true or not, whatever did happen, William Wallace effectively kicked off the Wars of Independence, right here. Whatever the motivation for Lanark, Wallace was now very much an outlaw, very much on a collision course with his own fate. His next move was to double down team up with William the Hardy, the Lord of Douglas, and attack the ancient town of Schoon, the seat of Scottish kings. And from there, there was no going back.